we, we think maybe this is something we should be doing. She's a poet. I write music. And <laughs> wor words are hard for guys. You know, so. Can you see this? Oh, there's words there. Good. And we apologize. We're learning it, so. One more, because I pulled away from the mic. I am on the downstairs, looking up, seeing all the people in my way. Keeping to the railing, tentative Climbing in the middle of the fray I am on the third rung, yearning still Right here in the middle of the din Ready for instruction Bold of heart Learning how to take it on the chin two short poems I'd like to share with you today. The first is called Greener Grass. I want your life. I don't know what that is, by the way. And I'm happy with my life, actually, at least most days and much of the time. 
but you made a reference to a recent past of life in Montreal and current residents in New Haven, and it sounded alluring. Your black clothes, too, similarly matched by your wives, and although I don't know you or anything about you, I want your life. Maybe just for a day, though. As I said, I like my life. And the second one is called Treason Storm. Thunder rumbles, lightning flashes, water rushes down the road, the dog cowers at my feet, and trees dance, although I can't feel the wind. Do they dance like the dog because they fear the lightning or in excitement at the rain? Thanks. This is an excerpt from a story entitled Awake in the Dark. Phil Waldron unloosened his soiled apron, walked through the swinging door, and sat in a booth furthest from the kitchen. After a morning of serving up orders of scrambled eggs and buttermilk pancakes and buttered toast, he rested during a lull at the full, full moon diner. He surveyed the 36-seater eatery, its tile floor and oak walls and booths, lined up alongside the railroad-style windows. He looked out at the highway in front of the diner. He heard a cacophony of sounds that enveloped him, the heavy bass that beat out from a speeding sports car, the churning garbage truck next to the dumpster, and the evangelist who yelled at strangers. He eyed the customers, workers in jeans and tool belts, businessmen in suit coats and ties, college students wearing baseball caps and sneakers. He was a 24-year-old cook in a Massachusetts town that bordered New Hampshire. He had thinning dark hair and narrow eyes and a slender, rigid body. On those days he didn't work, he stayed home in his apartment surrounded by mildewed books where he straddled the boundary between what had come before him and what lay ahead. It had been almost a year since he had come looking for work arriving with his longing, his desire to touch life, not incrementally, but all at once, taking life on without hesitation or fear. Untethered from his roots, Phil began meeting people that had been fixtures at the full moon. There was Gladys Moore, a tiny woman with luminescent white hair and skin that dangled under her chin, making her look like a turkey in flight as she raced around balancing plates of food. He listened to her daily admonishments. A lady leaves something on her plate, she would shout at a customer who scurried out the door. He admired how she stood up to the new waitress, the one with black liner around her eyes who was sleeping with the owner. Andy came down hard on Gladys whenever Carmela complained that she was being harassed by the older waitress. Phil imagined Gladys as she might have looked in her youth and wondered why no man had claimed her before the crease lines and hardness set in. Phil liked how she softened whenever they spoke. Being alone is not the worst thing, she would say. You've always got yourself. Phil was intrigued with his boss. Everyone called Andy the hat, since he usually appeared wearing something on his head. He was a man whose emotions were explosive and visible like a woman's. Andy was easily moved to tears whenever he heard a hard luck story. When Andy saw Phil, he would give him lessons on how to live. Use your left hand as well as your right hand when you work here. Why else did God give us two hands? Phil accepted these platitudes, just as he accepted Carmela's newfound status as queen of the diner, and knew enough not to answer the ringing payphone on her days off since Andy always beat the hired help to the phone. Still, Phil was appreciative of Andy's efforts to engage him, describing the progress of his new contemporary house being built on the west side of town, explaining to Phil each detail and how one's dream house came together from an architect's model to the actual laying down of the materials. He had even promised Phil that the two would one day get into his sailboat and go see the Mediterranean sun. The brief rest did Phil some good replenishing him for the final push before the diner closed. He would get up and walk back behind the marble top counter, take down the board listing the day's dinner specials, and erase each one. 
Over the next few hours, he and Bean, the cook, sliced piles of roast beef and cut up vegetables and diced mounds of cheese. Phil was learning how to cook from a man approaching 70 but acted like a cult of 25. Bean's favorite stories involved Andy, especially when Andy had forgotten a rubber drain stopper and a customer's hot turkey sandwich. Andy was so embarrassed and hurt, he walked a waitress down into the kitchen and fired her. You've got to love the guy, said Bean. He really believes what he says, even if he can't see how far his life falls from the bullseye. So that's an excerpt of a short story. If you're interested how it ends, the books are back there. I'm interested in readers, not money, so you can give Cheryl the money. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Kringle arrives early. Oktoberfest in Germany comes but once a year. It's a time for revelry when folks drank lots of beer. Hans Kringle was a young man who dearly loved his beer. But after a night of merriment, his thinking wasn't too clear. He wished to play a joke on a friend. And believing his thinking was 200 proof, Hans tried to climb through his friend's window, but somehow landed on the roof. Young Mr. Kringle saw an open hole and lurched over to see. He went head first through the window, only to learn it was a chimney. Hans whooshed 50 feet down the flue. Then by some dumb luck, his rapid descent halted when he became stuck. A sobered Hans shouted for help, but couldn't raise a peep. For everyone in the house was drunk and fast asleep. But God protects drunks and old folks. So someone finally heard Hans' shouts and called the fire department, who pulled the reveler out. They then took Hans home and put him in his bed, where he slept for 12 hours while sugar plums danced in his head. Thank you very much. Thank you again and again for the words and the song. This is, uh, over the years here, have inspired me. So it's a first time of putting my <clears throat> storytelling years into 11 poems and, um, I, I would love to show it to my 25-year-old self, this little book called Gathering Threads. It makes me so happy to have it. Um, of the 11, I'll just read you the first one. It's called A Beginning. <clears throat> Poems, stories, even intentions need revision. And yet I subject Glorious phrases, words saved here and there on scraps of paper to lie unseen between pages of my journals. Poems wait, always wait. Just one image could make everything come out right. Poor trapped words always to remain lonely and static. Without any middling or endings, they're doomed to wait, to be waited, always by another attempt, a new image. And then I got more and more. So thank you, everyone, and thank you for the encouragement from Cheryl and everything. Thank you. Um, I have a couple poems I'm going to read to you. And um, this first one is called Cherry. The man, when he approached me, or was it me, him, a tall, resident, reticent, smiling? Sorry. The man, when he approached me, or was it me, him, was tall, reticent, smiling. A picture of kindness. What you think of as boy next door or taller. 
what you think of as your brother. That reticence, sweet reticence, like a bowl of cherries left out too long. That fruit fly ridden reticence, that skin that holds cherry semblance long after the meat has corroded, that holds digested fly fodder. I saw his cherry skin, smooth, dark, inviting. And this is called On Finding a Story About Jack. I, I used to write a whole bunch of poems about this Jack and Lily. He is sure he placed the small 19th century bas relief frame he picked last week in the glove box after handing the man a 50. Now there's an, ana now there's an anachronism. Who drives in gloves anymore? How many pairs actually live in cars? With a potential buyer online, he needs to find his treasure. The dealer had had no idea of the value. What do we need? Food, shelter, a small frame that will turn $50 into 2000 Jack looks once more in his car. The March night air sears his skin. His torch runs dim. He fumbles the lock, and then, he's, and then he's in. Hold it right there, he hears from the right. Who's right? Who's right? He remembers the gin from, from before. It comes to this, with every new X, spores just add tears the men lily loved mushroom memories this is my house jack thinks where i grew up my car i don't need the man in my face in jack's face sewn in permanent frown no one needs the policeman reads his rights. Jack wants his quiet night inside to read more about beaten gold. What is your name, the officer asks. None of yours. Ah, there you are, my precious. Jack turns to the frame. He must, it must have been the gin. He slams the door on the officer's shin when he returns to his car. The blotter reports a knock on the door. A woman opens. Yes, I know him. My husband arrested, it says, assault. Lily tells her sister the story later as she slices mushrooms. Close call, her sister says. Another close call. That's all. Thank you. And I've been working on this poem and tweaking it. I could not quite recall if I read it here before, but <clears throat> it's really um, been with me. And you know how it is with the tweaking of poems. It's called Monarch Moment. Generations of monarch butterflies move across our continent. Each new generation takes the next step, remembering where to go. West in the fall and east in the spring, back and forth and back and forth again. Caterpillar to cocoon to winged being. On and on it goes, all of the stages marching across the North American continent, Turtle Island embracing the metamorphosis. And although we sometimes forget, we too must be part of a greater cycle. As the bloodlines surge forward, we have to know there is a greater pattern. A great melting pot occurred on Turtle Island following 1492. Europeans, Americans came together in a curious dance, making a new civilization. Together they forged this new place called the many states of being in the new world, and these states were united. Most of the states were named after Native American tribes that were named after description of place for example, Massachusetts named after the tribe of people calling themselves the people of many hills. Our new government was modeled after the government of the Seneca tribes, although the Supreme Court replaced the Council of Wise Women. 
This council of wise, older women was responsible for ensuring the longevity of the tribe for the next seven generations, and they could veto any proposed action by all the other councils. Seven generations, 1620, 1675, 1730, 1785, 1840, 1895, 1950, 1995. Seven generations of people since the Pilgrim's Landing. Where are we going? Are we caterpillars or are we still in the cocoon? Or are we becoming winged butterflies? Thank you. And, uh, I, have, I have two short poems, so I'll read this one first. This is called Taking It In. Sitting quietly, attentive to life, watching, listening, taking it in. The sky ear so blue, the trees gentle rustling, watching, listening, taking it in. Moment to moment, life in the present, watching, listening, taking it in. That's my first poem. And this one I wrote some time ago, too, about my mother. Um, because of my, my uh, injury, I have not been able to, uh, to visit her. She's in a nursing home a good distance away, so I thought it would be sort of a way of visiting her by reading this poem. My beautiful mother, you welcome each day with beauty and grace, taking one moment at a time and never lose face. I admire you so. <laughs> and hope to achieve the faith, love, and kindness through each day that you weave. May today be as special as you are, dear mother. I love you and honor you, a space held for no other. Thank you. I had the good fortune of going to Omega Institute in Rhinesbeck, New York this summer for a week of talking about celebrating poetry with Billy Collins and Mark Doty and Patricia Smith and Marie Howe. And it was a treat. And uh, Billy Collins uh, did a wonderful job in his morning presentation about writing poetry. And one of the th things that he said is, we as poets have to remember to keep our minds at play in our imagination and what we write about and not to lose sight of that as adults and all somber that we consider in our lives. And um, I. Uh, I uh, value that myself, uh, value children's play. Uh, in my past life in psychology, uh, I had written my uh, doctoral dissertation on the importance of children's play and learning. It's a long time ago, but uh, I do believe in the importance of that and for us as humans. But sometimes uh, myself, I lose sight of that for us that we still need that as adults. And so um, I thought of this piece because um, my dog Junie reminded me of this. Uh, I listen to too much news sometimes. And one day, Junie presented herself wanting to play uh, as I was listening to too much. So here's the good side of Junie. And it's called, Please Pay Attention When Your Dog Teaches You New Tricks. My mind is on 100 things today. Four million starving in Somalia, the state of our economy floundering, unemployment still high. Some of the Vermont roads and bridges have washed away in the latest flood. Eastern equine encephalitis is starting to strike. They warn us to be careful when we go outside. I said goodbye to my daughter today. Will she listen to me when I tell her to be careful out on her own? When I ask her to call me every night, if she can? I know she means well. But she does not understand my aging sense of urgency to paying attention to nearly everything with such importance with so much now magnified. 
And then Junie, my dog, enters, walks over to me, earnest brown eyes like mine, showing me she gets it. To be afflicted by every somber thing when you get older, like 50 and life around you begins to change. Are those tears of understanding? Then Junie is gone in a whir, back again with a squeaky toy she is prodding at me, a hard, overstuffed cat with the word help coming out of its distressed mouth, like a superimposed cartoon bubble, like me. The cat is in prison clothes and its head is in Junie's mouth, and Junie wants me to pull it off to get down and tug and throw and play. This is how you do it, she tells me. This is how you survive. You know what the world is going through. You have a billion conversations of worry and sorrow in your mind. They won't ever go away, but they soften a little as other voices you help you to keep moving on, prompt a smile, get you to be giddy even as the voice in you calls to heal, for your mind to stop, stay for a moment, to wag your tail as you walk out in the backyard, willing to race into the soft wind of night with the cicadas calling, morning dove sighing, the light of day fading into moon and stars, and someone somewhere is looking at you over a glowing candle that flickers when you go inside. All around you is picture perfect for a little bit, something of Eden, when you are willing to romp a bit, when you breathe in deep and breathe out the joy of your earlier days. And so I snatch the little well-chewed cat toy in its prison clothes, throw it up in the air, fall as it and I may. It's our work in this world. Thank you uh, for listening. Uh, to resiliency, to us all, uh, to being here today to celebrate words of poetry, story, and song.